4th of July. I mean, God is good, is he not? Not only living in a country, enjoying the freedoms we have, but also we just got done singing that song, right? Free, free, free from the greatest enemy that man ever had, and that is what? The enemy of death. And Jesus conquered it. All right, did something we could never do, and we live in that victory. This morning, we'll talk a little bit about making a difference, all right, in our lives. And, um, you know, I think about this. I, over the years, I've heard so many different testimonies from missionaries and others, all right, uh, true stories, uh, talking about how one individual life can make a difference all right, in somebody else's life or in a culture or in a society. I put down a couple of them, again, my uh, most favorite ones. I was raised, um, born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, I uh, lived there. So I've got to start off, <coughs> excuse me, with a story of Hattie Mae Wyatt. Now, this is going back 100 years ago, over 100. She uh, lived 1877, only lived really for seven years. But anyhow, in Philadelphia, she wanted to go to Sunday school, all right? But they couldn't take her into Sunday school because they had no room for her. And um, what ended up happening, of course, she regretted that and, and uh, really wanted to go there. But they didn't have no money to build the church any builder, the Sunday school classes any larger. But in less than two years, she fell ill and she died at the age of seven. And uh, nobody had guessed her strange secret. And beneath her pillow was found a torn pocketbook with 57 pennies. 57 cents, wrapped in a scrap of paper. On it was written these words, all right, to help build the little temple bigger so that more children can go to Sunday school. Now, I can't give you the whole story. What, what happened, that pastor took those pennies, and different people in the congregation took those pennies and others and contributed money based on those pennies, gave them back, and they raised enough money to build, all right, the Baptist temple there in, all right, Philadelphia. But also from that ministry, from that little girl who started at, anybody here, here at Temple College in Philadelphia? How about uh, the Temple Hospital, Temple University? All of this, all right, because of that little girl's seven years old, all right, and no one would have known, all right, again, the difference that she made. Then the story, I think Matt told this one time, I've told it a lot of times, about this man walking uh, on the ocean, like a lot of us do when we go to the beach, and uh, was walking to the beach before he was going to work, and he, as he was walking along, he looked down, saw, uh, you know, some kind of human figure down the beach, and uh, seemed to him that the person was dancing or doing something, so he uh, ended up walking faster to catch up. As he got closer, he noticed that the figure was a young man, and he really wasn't doing any dancing at all. He was reaching down, all right, into the sand, picking up small objects and throwing them to the ocean. He came uh, closer, and he cried out, good morning. Can I ask, you know, what, what are you doing? The young man paused, looked up, and said, well, I'm throwing starfish. You probably heard the story into the ocean. And uh, the man, you know, thought for a second, I, I got to ask this. Why are you throwing starfish in the ocean? All right. The young man replied, the sun is up, tide's going out. If I don't throw them in, though, they're going to die right there on the beach. Upon hearing this, the wise man commented, but young man, don't you realize, man, look down there. There's miles and miles of beach and starfish all along the beach, every mile of it. You can't possibly make a difference. And uh, at this, while the man was saying that, the young man bent down. Picked up yet another starfish, threw it in the ocean. As it meant the water, he said this. Made a difference to that one, didn't it? <laughs> and uh, again, I think of that story. And you know, this morning, as I was, in fact, yesterday, as I was doing my devotions, I told you I have a devotional that talks about Christian history. And I was reading uh, history on the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, I don't know if anybody had to experience ever going to Hawaii, I know Di and I went, that's our favorite place, all right, and uh, be able to go, but this is a story about a young man by the name of Titus Cohen, all right, uh, again converted about 150 years ago when there was Charles Finney revival, and he was set as a missionary, one of the first ones, the Hilo, uh, Hawaii, um, then it was known as the Sandwich Islands, it wasn't the state at that time, 
And his responsibility, he was going to train teachers to oversee about two dozen missionary schools uh, there on the islands, all right? But uh, his vision, well, he, he wanted to make more of a difference than that. In other words, he wanted to reach people uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what he did, he gave his students an extra long Christmas vacation, all right? Christmas in Hawaii is not like Christmas here. You didn't have to worry about snow or any storms, all right? And what he did, he did a walking tour of the big island, all right? And he visit the schools he was responsible, and he'd go to the villages, and he would preach, all right, the gospel. And he would try to cover uh, three, four, five villages each and every day. And uh, as the story goes, again, literally that crowds grew and grew, all right? And um, they would come back the next morning wanting him to speak again about the gospel. And he returned home to Hilo a month after that. He found heightened interest in the way of salvation. And uh, the whole story comes down that literally that by 1853, this was a young man, all right, sent over there to be a teacher, all right, but he felt he had to share the gospel, all right. By 1853, 56,000 of 71,000 native Hawaiians were professing Christians. Man, I look at that. I, I had read another story, and I forget it, uh, and it was this week about a missionary that had converted, I, I think they had about eight believers in the area that they were at, and they had to leave that area because of persecution uh, during World War II, and they were worried when they went back, would there be any, would there be those eight believers? And uh, eight years later, when they were able to go back to there, there was 8,000 believers, <laughs> all right? And what I'm saying, I guess, this morning is, is that, you know what? I don't care who you are. I don't care what your situation is. All right? God gave us life, conquered that great victory of death for you and I to make a difference, all right, uh, in the lives of those around the society in which we live. Now, let me give you a little preface before I end up praying. I believe we live in the midst right now of, of a generate at least of a time, when it seems like we're, at least to me, we're losing the next generation, all right? Re-Christian uh, faith, uh, re-biblical values, be biblical standards. Uh, as I look at uh, much of our media, many school districts in the nation, entertainment outlets, actors, actresses, at least again, much of them, uh, many in the music industry, many professional athletes, seem to be brainwashing our youth at an alarming rate and challenging traditional Judeo-Christian uh, values uh, uh, which our nation was founded on. Our next generation was also, it seems to me, being re-educated not only in morality and faith, but also on the nation's history, all right? Uh, literally being rewritten. Now, in the midst of this, you see all this stuff going on, all right? You can get angry, and I'm, I'm 74 years of age, so I, I, I get a little angry just when you see it, but that doesn't accomplish anything, all right? So my question is, in the midst of what is going on, what is to be my response as a believer, all right, in Jesus Christ? Am I just to sit quietly by and say, you know, what was me? I hate to see how things are going. I wish things were better, but there's nothing I can do. Tell ourselves, you know, poor little me. I'm, I'm really a nobody, so I can have no effect. Uh, I don't believe so, all right? I believe we are called in the midst of times like this to make a difference, all right? Uh, to fight against the tide, what is happening, not to go along with it, all right? And God has his children, you and I here, to make a difference. He has given us life that we would be light, that we be salt, all right, in the society around us. Um, I saw this, we're talking about the title of this message, that on a tombstone, I was reading this illustration, that somebody had written... All right, it was man's name, and the caption underneath the tombstone, he made a difference. You know what? I would like that to be on my tombstone, all right, that I made a difference. It made my family, my spouse, people around me, not that they just worked, you know, a job, made a little money, you know, wanted a couple vacations, accumulated, quote, some things. I want my life to make a difference in those that are around me. Now, you might not be, you know, a news commentator, what they call them today. 
might not own a uh, media outlet, be it actor or actress, professional athlete, entertainer, but I don't care who you are, we can make a difference, all right? Even in what is going on today. In fact, we have to make a difference. And the question is going to be, what I'm going to look at this morning, is how do you do that, all right? How can I, you know, as an average, you know, believer, how can I make a difference in the world uh, with, uh, around me? Now, what I'm going to do before I pray, I want you to turn, all right, this will be the first verses I look at, in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter, I don't even need that, so I'll let you have that. Boom. Luke chapter 6, verse 46, all right? And then let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, dear Lord, that where we find ourselves today is not an accident. Dear Lord, who we are is not an accident. Where we live is not an accident. The times in which we live are not an accident. You have placed us here for a reason. That we are to make a difference. That we are to make you known. And dear Heavenly, we come before you, dear Lord, desiring to know how can we do that. Dear Lord, what are we to do that our lives would make a difference in someone's life around us, in the society in which we live? So I pray, dear Lord, that you would take your word this morning, that you would convict each one of us individual, that we would do what we can, live as we should, and make a difference in the society in which we live. Dear Lord, at this time that we celebrate the great freedoms that we have, that we would live in such a way that our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren would still have the freedoms to practice their faith, and not only the freedoms, but that they would come to know you. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So let me give you some things, all right, principles of making the difference, all right? The first one, we need to be a person of principle. You know, a lot of times we think and make a difference. I got to go out and I got to do something, do these great things. I'm really going to concentrate what we need to be. If you're not the person you need to be, not the believer that you should be, I don't care what you do, you're not going to make a difference. God is more interested in what you become than what you do, all right? And so the challenge is going to be that we would be these people, all right? And the first thing I think of, I need to be a person of principle, my life needs to be founded on principles, but not just any principles, all right? My life needs to be founded on the principles of what? The Word of God. There is a difference between knowing the Word of God and having a life founded upon the Word of God and living on those principles. That's why God, when he came to Joshua, said this. He said, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. All right, God's word. But you're going to meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. You catch what he said? He said the key, Joshua, is not just knowing the word. The key is not just knowing the principles. The key is not just being able to recite Bible verses, but you need to do them and you need to live them out in your everyday life. You want to make a difference? People need to see the truth of the Word of God being lived out in your life and being lived out in my life. And we do this, we reap the blessings of God, all right? The blessings, first of all, for our own good, Deuteronomy 6.24, Moses speaking, he says, the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, the fear of the Lord our God. And he adds this. He commanded us to do this for our good. You know, when I make a decision, when you make a decision to obey and live in the principles of the Word of God, guess who benefits? We benefit. We benefit, all right, by aligning our lives with God's Word. But not also do we benefit but when I stand on the principles of the Word of God, it benefits my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, and those around me and my society. You want to change society? Then you determine by the grace of God, I'm going to live on the principles of God's Word. Now, I had you turn to Luke chapter 6, 
verse 46. This is a parable that Jesus gave. Sometimes, uh, you know, we use this in, you know, Sunday school and with the kids, but this wasn't written really basically for children, all right? There's a principle here we need to understand. Principle of the parable of the builders. Let me read the verses. He says, Jesus speaking, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do the things that I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you what he's like. All right, a man who hears the word and lives his life out based on that word. He says, he is like a man building a house who dug deep, laid the foundation on the rock, and when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against the house, and it could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard, all right, the word, and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that man, no, it doesn't say man, does it? It says the ruin of that what? House. It's not only the man, but also the children, the wife. Whoever lived in that house, their ruin was what? Great. Now, you notice when you read this, these two men are very similar, if I understand this. They were both building a house. Now, Jesus is not talking about a house. He's talking about a life. They're both living a life, building a life, that they would have a meaningful life. Both of them also, as they were trying to build their life, they heard what? They heard the Word of God. They were under the teachings of of God's word. They both, if I understand this, professed that Jesus was Lord. Both of them said, hey, we believe. They both worked. It said they both worked on building their house. In other words, they were doing things. And they both experienced what? Storms. See, even when you're a Christian, storms are going to come in your life. But the one difference is, one heard and lived out what he heard, all right, and the result of that, his house, his life, was able to stand in the midst of the storms. Now, you're talking about storms, all right? It, Jesus is not talking about physical storms. He's talking about persecution. He's talking about opposition. He's talking about suffering. He says when that comes, if your life is built on the Word of God, you're going to be able to stand, all right? Because God is not always going to deliver you from the storms. But God's going to give you the grace to stand in the midst of those storms. But it's only as you build your life on the principles of the Word of God. And the man who heard but did not build, it says his house fell. Then he adds these words, the ruin of his house was great. Beyond what, whatever he imagined. He, he, he didn't realize that that could make such a difference. And the ruin was to him and to his entire house. And I'm saying this morning, want to make a difference in somebody's life? Want to make a difference in the world around? I got to determine, I'm going to be a person of principle. I'm not only going to hear the word of God preached from Pastor Matt, whoever, but I'm going to turn by the grace of God. I'm going to live out those principles in my life. I don't care if people agree with them, disagree with them. I don't care if I'll, I'll step in the society in which I live. I am going to live by the truth of the Word of God. Not only knowing God's Word, but living forth those truths before others. Let me give you another quote, A.W. Tozer. And I, again, when I was up in uh, northeast uh, Jersey from up there, uh, many of you are familiar with him, a great Bible teacher. I uh, started a Bible college up there. And I love what he said at the end of one of his books. is, I don't care what Plato or any other court authority, all right, or, you know, educator or philosopher, all right, uh, thinks about redemption or any other subject. Jesus Christ is the one who saved me. He is the one who transformed me. He is the one who stands with bleeding hands pleading for me. He is the one who shall speak and raise me from the dead. So I don't care what they say in New York. I don't care what they say at the university or in Columbia. The man who's a Christian says, did Jesus say that? Then I'm going to obey it. And this 
shall be I what I act upon and live upon my total life. That's where we need to be. All right? Is we're not assessing what, you know, new experts tell us what is true, but I'm going to live a life of principle. And so that would be the first thing I would give you, determined to be a person of principle. I'm going to use um, the letter P with all these. Second, determined to be a person of pas a pattern, P-A-T-T-E-R-N. God intended each one of us, all right, to be a pattern for our family and society. You understand when God created Adam and then Eve and put them in the Garden of Eden, their responsibility was to be a steward of his creation and to raise what? Righteous offspring. And that Adam and Eve would be a pattern, a godly pattern, a holy pattern for their children. What went astray is that Adam and Eve sinned, all right? And uh, again, we are in the situation that we are in. And God is to be that pattern. Remember, God walked with Adam in the cool, all right, of the morning. And uh, God is to be our pattern. In the Bible, you find verses such, be holy for what? I am holy. All right, you find uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, for to you this uh, that were called, that you just as Christ suffered for us, leaving us the example that we should follow or walk in his steps. In other words, that we are to follow the pattern that our Lord and Savior uh, gave us. In other words, you want to know how to live the Christian life? Read the Gospels. See how Jesus reacted to situations when he was persecuted, when he was hungry, when he was in pain. In other words, see the pattern that is left before us. And as we follow, all right, his principles, then I can be a pattern for my children, for my grandchildren, for my great-grandchildren, and for those I come in contact with. We, see, what we have to be careful is we don't tell people, all right, our family, whether kids or whatever, look to this other person, look to a pastor or look to whoever it is, all right, somebody else, be able to tell them, look to me. You can look to me as an example of what a Christian man or what a Christian woman can be, all right? I need to be a person, a pattern. See, any person who has one standard for others and another standard for himself, what do you call that person? Hypocrite, am I right? I got to understand, I, whether I want to believe it or not, I am a pattern for those around me. Paul knew this. Let me give you this verse, Philippians 3.17. Paul said this, man, it's a bold statement. He says, brethren, be followers together of me, for you have us for an example. The Greek word, all right, that he uses there for example, all right, is a mark left by a blow, and then it becomes a pattern or a mold. In other words, you, you make an impression, and then you're pouring something in that impression, or it's a mold that you have made. A lot of times, you know what we think? Instructions the answer. I'll take my kids, put them in Sunday school, I'll go to a small group, I'll, I'll listen to the Word of God. That is great. But I'm saying that instruction is not all we need. We need example, whether it's our children or whether it's us. How could Paul say, how could Paul say, follow me? The only way he was able to say that, because in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, I am a follower of who? Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, as I follow Jesus, you can follow me. All right? That's why we need to be a person of principle. So we need to be a person of pattern. And just how important is that? I, I personally believe this. And I, I mean, I've been involved in ministry teaching all my life. The most powerful teaching is example. I had it at my desk because I had it uh, for a Almost all 25 years, I was up outside New York City. I had a picture all right, of my eight-year-old son, Billy, who was a middle child and was <laughs> and everything a middle child could be. But he, I caught him one day. He was pretending to be preacher, and he was behind a pulpit and everything else, all right? 
and I took a picture, and I always had that in front of me, realizing they see you, all right? And they end up mimicking you. They see you at the times you wish they see you, and then they see you at the times they wish they never would have seen you, all right? But I'm saying example is important. We all need Christian examples. I tell people I have the opportunity in my life, being older, to hear some of the greatest pulpiteers of this country, all right? Preachers of years gone by who now are with the Lord. But I say this, this is true. The greatest messages I have ever heard have not been behind some pulpit in a church of five, ten thousand 10,000 people, but they have been in the living room seeing the example of another believer going through a difficult situation. I used to walk down from my, our church down the street on Passaic Avenue and uh, visit this lady who was suffering from cancer, always thinking as a young pastor, I'm going to do her, her quote, you know, favor. I'm going to make a ministerial visit. I'm going to encourage her as she's suffering greatly. And I was new to the church when I first visited her. I left there with head bowed, saying, I need a face like that. That she was in the midst of agony and trusting God, and she was quoting verses to me. She was preaching to me. And I'm going, I need that kind of faith. See, I need that example. I, need to, I can study the Word of God all I want, and I should be in God's Word. But I need to see the example even before me of somebody who is actually living it. And I say, that's real. And God ministers through that example. And I'm saying all of us need that. We need to determine not only to be a person, really a principle, but a person of pattern. Let me give you another P, a person of persistence. Here's a, a tough word for me, consistency, right? There needs to be an overall consistency in our life. As you get older, it seems like there's no such thing as consistency. Uh, if you're older, you tell me, you get up one morning, you're feeling great. Get up the next morning, you're feeling terrible. You don't know what happened, all right? But I'm saying there needs to be consistency in our Christian life. We need to be consistent and persistent in striving to live by the principles of the Word of God. I can't be a quitter. I wish I could tell you every day I feel like living according to the Word of God. Every day I feel like doing what's right. Every day I feel like encouraging people. I never want to bite anybody's head off. I just, I just, I, I want to always do what's right. That's a lie. Some days, man, it's like a cloud comes over you, right? You don't, anybody like me, you don't even be around people. <laughs> You're afraid to be around people. But I got to understand, it's one thing feeling those things, it's another thing acting on them. Am I right? Who cares what I feel like, right? I need to turn my feelings and not going to turn my actions. I need to learn to discipline myself to do what is right despite whatever the circumstances are. See, circumstances are going to change. Am I right? You see it in the society today. And I'm saying no matter if circumstances change, that's not going to change what I believe, and that's not going to change how I live and I act. There needs to be consistency. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we'll reap if we do not faint. Why do you think Paul wrote that? Because sometimes you're in the midst of a storm, and it is difficult to keep going on, right? You just get tired. You ever say the words, what's the use? I just want to give up and just forget it all. You can't do that. You can't do that. We can't be a quitter. I, I got to continue on. And I'm not talking about being, you know, perfect or keeping the Bible and its principles. Really, I mean, totally. I'm saying that you're not. We're all going to sin. Anybody see... I guess it was next last episode of The Chosen, of Mary Magdalene, all right? I, 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 I just loved, I love that. If you haven't watched The Chosen, you got to get If Bill Hegedus can get the app and cast it to a TV, anybody in the world can do it, Jason. Anybody. But Mary Magdalene, all right, of course, we know that, uh, again, that uh, sh she was, uh, ended up saved. And she became a follower of Jesus. But in this episode, she went back. She had a, a crisis of faith 
thinking I'm not good enough, all right? And she backed away from Jesus. But she ended up coming back, and Jesus was there to accept her. See, God already knows. See, God already knows we're not perfect. <laughs> I mean, it's like God is like Mary Magdalene, or when we sin, you think God's going, oh, I never thought that would happen. I ain't alive. I, I thought you were perfect. He knows. But he still loves us. And what I'm talking about, we keep the principles of the Word of God as a central reference point in our life. And sometimes when we do sin, we go right back to that reference point. I like, and this is a true story, all right? Admiral Byrd was a great explorer, all right, North Pole. He got lost one time, all right? Absolute true story. He was uh, in, in a blizzard, was way below zero, all right? His hut was about 100 yards away, but the snow was coming down so heavy, you couldn't see. You, you lost visibility. What he ended up doing, he had one of those walking sticks you see where they use to check out the ice for crevices. He put that in the, in the ice, and he had a, a bright scarf, and he tied it around that pole. And he would go a certain number of yards out, keeping track of the pole as a reference point, trying to find that hut. Four times he did that. On the last time, he was able to find that hut and saved his life. I'm saying there's times we get off course. But we got a reference point, and we go right back. That we repent, and he is there to forgive. All right? I'm talking about consistent. I'm not talking about being perfect, but I'm talking about consistency. And I, our kids see that. That's why I learned, Di and I raised seven kids. Two things I had to remember. Number one, I love you. And number two, I am sorry. I blew it. All right? The kids already know. Our Lord knows. But persistence, I'm going back. In other words, I still believe what I believe. And I want to live a consistent life. Let me give you a fourth one. How about being a person of passion? Passion. Be excited. You know, I look around. A lot of these groups that are challenging, really, um, you know, the morality, faith, they are, one thing I'll give them credit, they are passionate about their cause. Am I right? They're, I mean, they're willing to do whatever. And I'm saying, I need to be a person of passion. Passion towards our God. We can't say that Jesus is the answer and live a life that is like, I mean, it's like there's no passion, there's no love, there's no emotion. See, if Christianity is worth everything, isn't it worth our total devotion? What was God's devotion towards us? God so loved the world, he gave what? His son, the best of heaven. If you can't get excited about a God who chose to love you and I despite our sin, commended the love towards us, why were we as sinners? Man, I don't know if you have a heart. <laughs> we need to be in motion. That's why you read Matthew 22, 37. It says we are to love God with how much of our heart? All of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul. We are uh, in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, we're to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Lean not to our own understanding. Acknowledge Him all of our ways. See, others must see and understand we love Him above all else. And He's Lord of our job, Lord of our home, Lord of our lives. No matter what happens, no matter what the circumstances, He's going to have a heart and allegiance. You know, I keep, you know, stories and clippings all my life. This one I've had for over 20 years. This is a, uh, a statement. This was from a pastor in Zimbabwe who was martyred for his faith. Translated into English, they ended up finding this in his hut after he died. It's the best English translation we have. He wrote this, I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his and won't look back, let up, Slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm done and finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. 
I don't have to be right. I don't want to be first. I don't have to be tops. I don't have to be recognized. I don't have to be praised. I don't have to be rewarded. I live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by Holy Spirit. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road may be narrow, my way rough. My companions few, but my guide is reliable and my mission is clear. I will not be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice or hesitate in the presence of adversity. I will not negotiate the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up. I won't shut up. I won't let up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. He ends it this way. He says, I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must give all until I drop, preach until all know, work until he comes, and when he comes for his own, he'll have no problems recognizing me. My colors are clear. And I'm saying we need to have a passion that the Lord, when looking down from heaven, he knows which side we're on, right? That we're passionate about our God. And I might add, and I can't go too, but we need to be passionate about other people. We need to love other people. Sometimes it's so easy, and I found myself with this, that when people disagree with us, we want to just condemn them and beat them down. We need to understand people that are involved in management, they, they have been led astray by the wicked one. Their minds are blinded. They need to see the gospel. And they need to see Christ. Our heart should be broken. Our God is not willing that any perish, but all would come to repentance. And we need to, standing on truth, but yet a life of love and compassion. And uh, God's love, you know, is in spite of love, is it not? Love with no conditions. Why were we yet sinners? Christ loved us. So my challenge, be a person. Of, if you can be passionate about anything, we can be passionate about our God. Let me give you a fifth one. Be a person of purity. There will make you stand out today, right? Purity. Leviticus 27, sanctify yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. To be sanctified means that you're set apart from this world. See, I'm not to be like this world, all right? In fact, if... You know when you know that you're walking with God is when there's, you're creating friction, all right? Because if there's no friction in your life, all right, in the midst of this world, it means you're going in the same direction, all right, as this world, am I right? Jesus created friction, uh, seems to me. That's why they crucified him. And the Word of God says that we, all right, need to stand on the principles of purity. See, when we're born again, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, and we are no longer our own. I'll give you some familiar verses, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit comes to live within me. Who is in you? Whom you have from God, and you are not your own. When you get saved, you're not your own. Christ died for you, all right? We are risen again, all right, and a new life. For you are bought with a price. And Paul says, therefore, you glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. See, I can't do what I want to do with my life. It's not my life. It's his, all right? And I need to live a life conformed to his image. I need to be holy because he is holy. And we, as we become the unique property of God, we need to be used for His honor and glory, glory manifesting that purity. And because of that, we have to abstain from the evils, all right, of this world that would harm this temple, all right, destroy our testimony. I, I think today, if you want to make a difference, probably the greatest way to make a difference is really, and I think this is young people, is especially, all right, is stand and be a young man and young woman of purity. I mean, people are going to ask you, wait till you're married? Not move in? 
in other words, not do this or that, whatever it is, they're not going to understand. And then you have the opportunity to what? Explain. This is why. I mean, it's going to stand. And I've learned enough of this. that People might come against you. People might say all this. But when those same people seem to go through very difficult circumstances, and I've had this happen, who do you think they reach out to? They reach out to you who stood on the principles of the Word of God. You want to make a difference? You need to be a person of purity. Let me give you the last two very quickly. Number six, be a person of prayer. If we ever needed to be a praying people, it is today. First Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, cast your dependence on God. We need to, we need to be people of prayer. People need to know that we're praying. And then the seventh, a person of Here's one of my toughest, patience. Ah, tough word, right? Especially Paul when he wrote the Thessalonian church. 1 Thessalonians 5.14, be patient towards all men. People are not going to live up to your expectations. Am I right? <laughs> I just got them coming from Texas. Like, stay, there was, man, where I was, all right, in the middle of nowhere, there's no such thing as Holiday in Hampton or any of that. So I stayed in the house with my granddaughter and two great grandkids, three and four. Woo! Texas tornadoes, man. It's like I realized, okay, I know why you have children when you're young, right? And it ends up patience, right? Uh, people are not going to live up to your expectations. We think, boy, well, you got to say this, you got to do this. Uh, they're going to fail like we have failed. And we tend to get impatient with the shortcomings of others. I need to remind myself, it takes time to build a person of faith. I need your patience, you need mine. Am I right? So I'm, I'm saying we need to accept the challenge. I, I want to, by the grace of God, make a difference in my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, and the society around me. I'm not worried about reaching thousands. If I could just touch a few lives, that matters. Just like that starfish, am I right? And you know what, I was, I was thinking about this, and I came across this quote. It's by ex-president Jimmy Carter, and I really was not, I mean, it's like all of us, politics doesn't matter, but he wouldn't have been my favorite president, but I admire his Christian character. I admire his, his standards for his life. Listen to the statement he made. He says, I have one life, and I have one chance to make it count for something. My faith demands that I do whatever I can, wherever I am, whenever I can, for as long as I can, with whatever I have, to try to make a difference. Whew, man, what a statement. Am I right? And if I'm right, how old is he now? He, he's like in his late 90s and still living that out. If we could say that. You know my challenge, 4th of July, we're living in his freedoms. I need to make a difference in society in which I find myself right now. That my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren are going to live in the freedom to practice the faith that we have right now. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around for a second. I don't know what your situation is or what your circumstance is in your life. But what I'm saying this morning, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, you can make a difference. You can make a difference in your kids' lives, your grandkids, your great-grandkids. You understand by making a difference in your children's life, you automatically make a difference in your grandkids' lives. You touch their lives. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're a child of God, God wants to use you to make a difference in this world. Maybe this morning God's convicted your heart and soul and you want to come to this altar this morning as our practice is. You want to bow your head and bow your knee and say, Lord, I want you to use your life, use my life to make a difference in those around me. I would challenge you to do that in that commitment before him maybe you're here this morning it's another need you need to come 
Maybe you're here this morning and do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. See, it's one thing to know the Word of God. It's another thing to act upon it. See, for many years I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I heard the truth that I was a sinner. I heard the truth that Jesus was the Son of the living God. I heard the truth that He died on the cross for all men's sins. I heard the truth that I need to put my faith and trust in Him as atonement for my sin. I heard it, but I didn't act upon it. But praise God, came the day I acted upon it with the prompting of the Holy Spirit of God. The question is, have you acted upon it? Have you personally, individually invited Jesus Christ into your life, accepted Him as your Savior and as your Lord? If not, you come to this altar and bow your head before Him. Invite Him into your life this morning. Ask Him to save your soul. I'm going to ask if everyone would stand. Everyone standing, heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to ask Jason to have the group lead in just a couple verses of invitation. Pray some. And if you need to come to this altar this morning, we invite you to come.